Hello, uh, my name is Timothy Gager and welcome to um, Virtual Friday's Dire Literary Series. And uh, my feature tonight is um, Meredith Goldstein. So uh, let me tell you a little bit about Meredith to introduce her. Um, da -da -da -da. Oh, nice. All right, we'll do the old share. So here is Meredith. This is if uh, you don't want to listen to me now and you can tune out, but you can find all of this great information on meredithgoldstein.com. And she is a longtime writer for the Boston Globe and is a feature reporter. And she writes other things, including books. And she has three of those. Her advice column in the Boston Globe Love Letters is a daily dispatch of wisdom for the love lorn that and she started doing that in 2009. Um, so her book, are is her books are the young adult novel things that grow um her memoir can't help myself lessons and confessions from a modern advice columnist and chemistry lessons uh from houghton mifflin and uh so without any further stuff from me i'd like to turn it over to meredith and welcome thank you all right i'm gonna read we're the only two jews accompanied by one agnostic christian in Walsh's Funeral Home, a very Irish Catholic business near Hoppy's Liquor Store in Framingham. My uncle Seth, my best friend Chris, and I sit on one side of a stony gray conference table staring at the same horrendous thing, the massive crucifix hanging on the wall across from us. It's frightening, I whisper, because it is. The cross, with Jesus pinned to it, has to be four feet tall and just as wide. Jesus's miserable face looks like it's made of porcelain. There are tiny cracks on his forehead, spreading like spider webs just under his thorny crown. Blood is coming from his eyes. Jesus, Uncle Seth says, his own face sour as he narrows his eyes to examine Jesus's anguished expression. Indeed, it is, I say. He could not look more unpleasant, Seth adds, waving his hand toward the sculpture. He's having a very bad day, I say, and Seth smirks at my understatement. Seth's gray and black hair sticks up in all directions. My uncle is the coolest person in my family now that Grandma Cheryl is dead. He usually looks New York sleek, like a distinguished man in an advertisement for a watch. But right now he's red eyed and messy, and so am I. I know from a recent trip to the funeral home bathroom that my cat eyeliner has spread across my face and is inching its way to my ears. I can smell my own armpits. There are hospital cafeteria blueberry muffin crumbs stuck between my teeth. We're doing the best we can. We just lost our matriarch, the best person in the world. Chris, sh Chris shifts in a seat next to me. Our commentary about Jesus has made him uncomfortable. He taps his foot on the floor before he responds. They can't make a crucifix where Jesus is like smiling, he says, keeping his voice just above a whisper. He's literally dying on the cross. Chris, whose family helped found the new black church off Route 9, isn't sure what he believes anymore, but he knows the rules of Christianity and still tries to follow them when he can. He lives in the kind of house where you say grace before eating yogurt. He does not take the Lord's name in vain. His mother, Grace Burke, is a tall woman with flawless dark brown skin and the world's highest cheekbones, which she passed down to her sons. She loves to remind me, like every few weeks, that Jesus was a Jew and that when the time comes, by this I like to assume she means the alien apocalypse, I too will be saved. I tell her this is good to know. Seth nods his acquiescence on the Jesus point, but continues. Okay, fine, he's being crucified. It's horrible, I get it. But who wants to look at this in a funeral home of all places? It's so bleak. It's exactly where Christian people want to look at something like this, Chris, whose name is literally Christian, explains. For somebody like my mom, a crucifix is a comfort. She believes it's a reminder that Jesus died to save us. I get that, I volunteer, but I don't like that this particular Jesus has a body made of so many different materials. His face is clearly breakable, his stomach is like plastic. His fingers are made of fabric. He's like Franken-Jesus. Seth erupts, letting out an exhausted cackle. Good line, Lori. You should write that down and use it for something. And with that, even on what is probably one of the worst days of my life, I am floating. I am a ray of light. I am a genius. 
Uncle Seth has written two novels and teaches creative writing to college students at some of the best schools in New York. He doesn't just throw out compliments. So when he likes my work, it makes me feel invincible, like I can see my future. It looks a lot like his life, hopefully. Franken Jesus, I repeat, as I text myself so I don't forget. Let's try to keep it down, Chris says, noticing that people are walking by the door. There are grieving families looking at coffins in the next room. It's true. When we entered Walsh Walsh's funeral home, the three of us huddled together as if we were embarking on a haunted house tour. We passed a room full of coffins with sad looking families perusing them in rows. Most of the coffins had brownish wood with soft satin interior, but there was one shiny white one with silver trim that reminded me of the cheesy white limos some kids rent for prom. I imagine that it might have fluorescent lights inside. Maybe when you close the lid of the white party coffin, it plays electronic dance music. I grin, hearing the coffin beats in my head, but I keep that thought to myself. I don't wanna say anything else that will make Chris uncomfortable. There are crucifixes here, which means this is his world, not mine. I take a, look at, I take a closer look at him to see how he's holding up and I can't help but notice his perfect ears. I would like to trace them with my finger. I shake my head as if the action will knock every forbidden thought I have about my best friend out of my system. And I focus on Uncle Seth instead. I can't figure out how he's related to my mom, let alone her twin brother. They look the same, I guess. They have curly dark hair that is turning white at the same speed. They're both compact and fit, but they couldn't be more opposite in every way that counts. Seth is hilarious and talented and dedicated to his one passion. He has the world's most perfect relationship with his partner, the very dashing and British Ian, Ethan. Seth travels the world and sends me a keychain from every place he visits. Meanwhile, my mom is, as Grandma Cheryl used to say, still searching for her rudder. She goes from job to job, claiming that each one is her destiny. She's a life coach who pretty much reads only self-help books, and she preaches about them to everyone around her. She's on her sixth boyfriend in five years and goes all in with every single one of them. She's so messy as a parent that she's not even here right now. Her own mother died more than 24 hours ago, and somehow she's still trying to figure out how she'll get from Maryland to Massachusetts. It's only eight hours away, and there are a zillion flights between Baltimore and Boston. Also, she has a car. This isn't that difficult. Seth reads my mind and tries to soothe my anger. Five bucks says Becca arrives tonight. In a matter of hours, he says, <clears throat> and tucks a stray piece of hair behind my ear. He gives me a sad smile. Ten, day, so ten says we don't even see her today, I tell him. It's okay, I add. You're doing a very good job. Seth exhales. I know you probably have a lot of questions right now about what happens next, Seth says. Chris's foot starts tapping as fast as a rabbit's. We both know this has been coming. I've been living with Grandma Cheryl instead of with my mother since the start of high school. After mom changed jobs and cities for the zillionth time, everyone agreed, albeit reluctantly on my mom's part, that living with grandma would give me stability. Mom would visit on weekends when she could, <clears throat> Honestly, letting me go is the best decision she ever made. But now, without Grandma Cheryl, where will I live? I have one more year left of high school, the most important one of all. I don't want to leave this place that has become home. Seth watches me panic. I do the thing where I pull on my eyebrows. Don't think about it now, he says. It's not a question for today. He tries to change the subject. How did you get so tall? As of this visit, you could probably take me in a fight. I laugh because it's true. I'm five foot nine now, which makes me as tall as Chris and about an inch taller than my uncle. Four inches taller than my mom, his twin, and I look nothing like either of them. I'm blonde and so pale that sometimes you can see the veins in my forehead. Also, I'm not an athlete. Grandma Cheryl always says, I would said I was full figured like the statue of a goddess. But all that means is that I can't go anywhere without a high quality bra. And that if something is on a high shelf, I can usually reach it. Based on what's available on the internet, I know I look more like my father who works in sales, lives in Florida, and recently ran a 5K to benefit a colitis foundation. Good for him. Thank you so much. Uh, that was, whoa, um, what is that from? So it's actually, I'm so excited to read it because it's the first few pages of Things That Grow. And this is a young adult book, but that, that was released in March. And it's very much based on, that scene is very much based on 
the scene of my own family in my 30s when my mom died being a, a group of Jewish people. She wanted to be cremated and we were a bunch of Jews going into a Catholic funeral home in West Roxbury and Jews don't really get cremated. So we were really ignorant and making jokes and and I, <clears throat> and I really wanted to write it into an, a YA book and just get right in there. But the problem is that when I've done some readings about this book, I know that I have a lot of friends there with kids. And I think that kids can handle this certainly, but um, with every reading I've done, there has been a family I know who goes to Catholic school who like, where I have like been a little shy about reading those few pages where a bunch of Jews are mocking the very Christian um, symbolism in this funeral home. And I, as a Jewish person who isn't very religious in any way, right? I don't know much about Judaism either, which was part of the problem when my mom died. I didn't even know the cremation thing was bad. And, and you know, I wrote that into this character, like crucifixes are super scary to me. Like I look at them and they're really menacing. <laughs> so, but to know that it means different things to different people. So it was a real pleasure to get to read it tonight because I thought there are grownups here and um, I could test out reading it with knowing that I have no friends here with little children who are like, what, Jesus, what? <laughs> so. Well, I mean, I, I am done a uh, survey of the demographics here. So I don't know if there's some, uh, you know, Catholic, you don't want to disparage Jesus like in front of a bunch of Catholics. That's. <gasps> I mean, it really, it's, it's, it's shocking to me how many friends I have whose kids are now in Catholic school just based on where they live and where, and, and it is, this is a hard scene to explain without context of the rest of the book of, you know, who are these people and what does it mean to be Jewish and not know, like not know, you know, I remember, I mean, obviously now, now I'm older and I know, and in my thirties, I certainly knew what a wake was. But the first time I went to a wake, I was like, what's happening here? This is crazy. But then you realize that like some of the stuff that, you know, the Jews do are shocking to my friends. So yeah, I remember my first wake. I just disappeared and sat beneath the coat rack because I didn't want to deal with anything. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's it, and and yet, you know, going to so many Jewish funerals, like I appreciate that it's sort of like quick and in the ground and you're just, but there isn't the same space to understand it, it it can create this sort of fear of the reality of it right like there's so many people i know who never saw the body of the person they love ever again and so um there's a, a lot more room for magical thinking i think in that way but you know i really things that grow is really i keep promising to myself this is will be my last death book because every book i write is a is a is this a book about falling in love or is this a book about grief? And the answer is, I think for me, those things are tied together um, all the time and different kinds of grief. But this one is my most fictional book yet somehow the most tied to my own mother's death in terms of the experience, the nuts and bolts of what happened when, when happens when a person dies and the things you have to do immediately after. Well, since it's a YA book and I'm gonna, uh jump into one of John's questions. Are there topics that you feel you can't do? In a YA book, specifically? Yeah. Um, you know, this is a YA book that I think falls to the high end of YA, high end, not quality, but high end of age of, of YA. But, um, and I think, I would actually argue that there are some people who could probably say this is not a YA book. I mean, it is absolutely, it is in the sense that our narrator is 17 and she is, everything is through her lens. But one issue I was having while writing this book is that she is one of two young characters in this book and there are like 10 characters and they're adults, right? They, this is a book about how a young person narrates the experience of adults and how her perception of adult, you know, there's, you'll notice in that first chapter, she does a lot of Uncle Seth is amazing. My mother is terrible. Grandma Cheryl was amazing. It's like, you're either good or bad and there is no middle. And throughout this book, she starts to realize that maybe some of the really cool older relatives are not that cool and some of the not cool relatives are doing their best. So um, I think I want it to be genuine. And I think that a 17 year old like this character, one who is comfortable making fun of Jesus is gonna say some stuff and do some stuff. And um, I have a friend who's a, a middle school teacher in Texas and she always says to me, can you please moderate the swearing in your books? It's just easier to like bring them to my class. And I was like, I, I know what you're saying but these books are not like, teaching, I mean, they are, but um, it's funny that my my first young adult book, Chemistry Lessons, is an 18-year-old narrator, but she is a more innocent narrator. It is much more of a YA love story. It, it was easy to not 
get into too many adult topics. She's like a little bit ignorant about sex and, and this character is a lot more graphic and, um, you know, I, I like writing that because I do think that, you know, I think I have no kids, right? And I think um, the, another reason I wrote this book is I, my friend, Mark Shanahan at the Globe, his daughter, who's now in college, you know, I've been spending time with her since she was like seven years old. And I would think she was like 16 and I was driving her to a Taylor Swift concert. And she was like, you're so cool. Like, she was like, you're so much cooler than my parents. You're so much cooler than my mom. And I was like, you know, there's going to be an age where you realize like, I'm actually not like what it is about me is that I don't have kids. So I'm super well rested. Um, and I could do things like drive you to Taylor Swift because I'm not managing a household in the same way. And now that she's 20, she's like, she sees all of it, right? Like she sees that I have the ability to like do some stuff more because there are, there's more space and bandwidth in my brain and my life. And I think that relationship of this character being like, oh, Uncle Seth is so cool. It's like, well, maybe he's just, sing you know, maybe he's just childless. Maybe he's just living in yeah. New York and maybe he's spending money irresponsible. That was the other thing Julia would always say to me, oh, like, but you treat me to all these things and you're always taking vacations. I'm like, yeah, and I have no retirement plan. Like your parents are building a life like responsible grownups. And I'm like, let's stop at Ikea and buy stuff we don't need. Like that's where I was. So I think it was also a tribute to like kids sort of figuring out that Adults aren't always what they seem for better. Yeah, and parents don't get permission to be cool to their own kids. Like there's this I line, can't. there's this line that you just can't cross if you want to be responsible. So uh, you're saying this book is the most fictitious of all of your books of fiction. So you're a feature writer at the Globe. You're also the advice columnist. So which came first? Uh, were you writing before you were writing for a newspaper or how did it all kind of morph together? I mean, I'm, I think with like a lot of advice columnists and none of us thought we would be advice columnists and most of us were journalists. I mean, and are journalists. So I, you know, I studied journalism in college. I wanted to be, I mean, I think I knew I was more interested in writing features and my parents, my late mother and my father who was alive, like they were, they both went to Juilliard, you know, they were musicians. My dad went into to business after um, because he is a bassoonist who did not want to play with an orchestra, which is it's hard to take a bassoon on the road by yourself. However, um, I thought, oh, well, I'm not good enough for that. I did try music, but I thought, oh, well, maybe I'll be a music critic. And uh, when I got to the Globe, Sarah Rodman, who was a longtime music critic at the Globe um, and is now out in LA, she did me the great favor. Um, I think she took me to a white zombie concert, something like wow. that. And she said, and I was like, we were like in the front row and I was so deeply miserable. It was so loud. And she said, listen, the thing about being a music critic is you don't just go to the ones you like. And you have to be able to understand that something is good, even if you don't inherently like aren't drawn to it. And also the concerts you like, you might just want to go to those concerts and not write about it and just have a good time. And in that moment, I knew I was not going to be a critic. I wanted to highlight the work of artists. And then I wanted to write about non-artists and their human lives. And so I think I am always fundamentally a journalist who is really interested in people and the fiction started, I mean, I think, you know, the fiction started as a response to nonfiction, um, but it was, you know, I was, I wrote fiction before the memoir, but the memoir, Can't Help Myself, was felt like a cheat where like, it's hard to write fiction. You have to like make stuff up, even if it's based on reality. But the, the memoir, I was like, are people going to care about this? Because it's all, it's, all, it's all stuff that happened and happened to me. So who cares? You know, like, but it's, um, I think the journalism piece like doesn't go away. So how did you get to be advice columnist? Did someone say you're it? Or were you like, you know, like Steve Morse advice, like at the water cooler? Or... I mean, I think I've always been somebody who liked to talk about problems and over, pro and you know, I'm from, you know, I say this in the memoir, but like, I didn't know the Jewish sort of history of this when I started because I wasn't raised with a ton of actual hands-on Judaism. Like my sister was bat mitzvahed, but she, we didn't go to Hebrew school and she like sang Whitney Houston at her party. Like it was a party. We didn't, you know, we were very culturally Jewish, but without education. And it wasn't the Yiddish version of the Whitney Houston song? Or? Oh my God. Now I want to see if there is a Yiddish version of, of, of Whitney Houston, but she will, she would sing that. Um, you know, I think, but culturally growing up in a household where there are no boundaries to talking about problems and 
you know, this sort of matchmaker. Um, I mean, I think some people think of Yenta as like derogatory and I, I, I don't think I qualify in terms of what that is supposed to be, but, but this idea of, you know, I had friends in homes where you didn't talk about the uncomfortable thing. And I grew up in a home where it was like, oh, let's talk about the uncomfortable thing. Let's over talk it to death until we're all miserable, right? So I never, it, it also plays into my journalism, right? Like I really care about other people's problems and I wanna know and not in a gross way. Like I, I find it very interesting and I, and, so I had been writing for the Globe about doing these one-off stories about how interaction was changing because of the internet, which now dates me a lot. But um, you know, when Facebook became public to people who weren't in college, it really radically shifted life. And one of the first stories I did about that was that uh, was about high school reunions and about how there were no more surprises in high school reunions because it used to be that you go to a high school reunion and be like oh my god this person got so cool or this person is whatever now they're single and like now we know what they are we know long before we get there if we go right we know what their kids look like and what their spouse's name is and so this ruining the element of surprise was a thing that was very interesting to me which now obviously we all take for granted um but after a bunch of stories like that about how text messages were changing what is required of us, right, in communication, I said to the Globe, I, you know, I'm from Maryland, and I said, I can't believe in a place that is this focused on itself. I mean, Boston is its own thing, right? It's, it's um, living here now 20 years, I've forgotten that we're not the center of the universe, right? Because I think one of the great things about Boston, and I think actually one of the reasons the Globe continues to thrive is that there are a lot of people who would not not get the local news you know what I mean? Like Maryland was not necessarily like that. So um, I said, I can't believe you don't have someone in house writing an advice column right now because, and this was hard. This was Marty Baron was in charge. Who's, you know, was portrayed in spotlight and very accurately, I would say in, in spotlight, he's an absolutely brilliant person who was very serious and scary and was not, he was cutting resources left and right. And to him, any any of my time divided not writing feature stories was potentially wasted time and wasted labor but um but they let me and i think they they took a look at it and thought oh like that whole what qualifies you and i'm like well this is what qualifies me this like this question of my asking is the thing that qualifies me because if i were a therapist the therapists don't do that it's not responsible <laughs> Is, is anyone that screens some of your letters that you might get for the column or uh and if they don't, what's the strangest letter that you would by no means ever publish an answer to? No one screens, but I, you know, like sometimes people want the column to be a sex column and it's the Boston Globe. I mean, there's, and, and also I'm not, I, I, I would have, you know, I'm not Dan, Dan Savage and I'm, and. Um, well, you can answer questions about missionary position, right? I, I can, um, yeah, of course, that's the official position. <laughs> We're Puritans, aren't we? I mean, I, I exactly. I, I think we had a letter, I think this week that was from someone who is like, I'm getting older and my wife or girlfriend, I can't remember, wants to have sex on the couch. And like, there's this whole seduction that happens on the couch. And like, this clearly was like, caused this person physical pain. And they were like, I really just want to move to the bedroom, but then they take it as a, as a rejection. And I had this moment where I was like, this isn't even a letter really about sex. It's about communication. It's about aging it's about somebody's confidence with their body like what does it mean that my partner doesn't want to do this in the living room that you, you know they keep bringing me to the bedroom maybe you know however I it, I paused for one second before hitting publish because I was like you know it's not even so much that I thought it was too racy for the globe it was more like well what does this invite in the comment section and in the end it was totally fine but um you know often sex letters are not about sex but that those are the ones where I'm like you know if it's like I want to do this very specific thing and my partner won't do it. I'm like, well, I, okay. I, I don't even know what there is to say to that, but that's where. The advice, yeah. The advice you give, which tends to be the ones that you give the most that you run into that you end up saying like, do this. And we're, you do it so many times. It's almost like, you know, it's the most popular response back. So it would have been radically different before COVID. So right before COVID, the most common letter I was getting, which was different from the start of the column. So the column is now 12 years old. In the beginning, the most popular letter would have been about snooping, but about five years ago, six years ago, it became dating fatigue. I think that's the best way to say it, dating fatigue. People, especially in their twenties and early thirties 
who were on three apps swiping all night were at a bar swiping. And I remember being at an event at the Harpoon Brewery and this young woman came up to me and she just started crying. And she said, I'm so tired. And it was a book event for Can't Help Myself. So it was 2018. And she said, even at this event, I'm looking around, there are no men here, but I'm not gonna swipe. And I feel like I've missed an hour or two. That like this idea that we can never stop, that it's, it's um, she and she felt like even if she had a good first date, that person was moving on to other opportunities because there were so many faces. So you can't even engage with what's in front of you because it's like, what's next, what's next in this turnover. So I just felt like it was every day, it was, I'm so tired of this. I'm so tired of this and I haven't made a meaningful connection or I have made a meaningful connection, but now I have fear of missing out because I know what else is on there. So it was, it felt like this, um, like it was poison, poisonous for these people. And then COVID happened, right? And so all of a sudden, if you are being a responsible human in 2020, there's no dating fatigue, right? You've stopped. And if you, in the beginning, if you were talking to people online, it was very different. It was like, how are you? Where are you? What? It was like this weird empathy pen pal situation. And then at some point the weather got nicer and it was like, okay, people could take walks. And obviously they were people who were not COVID safe and they were running into each other's houses, but it, across the board, this was not, it had slowed. So I know a ton of couples that met during COVID because they had been so tired and all of a sudden they had four Zoom dates and then they took a walk. It became very like that Bridgerton show, like now we're gonna promenade and now we're gonna, and I don't necessarily think that's the right pace, but the fact that it just, I mean, I haven't had a dating fatigue letter in a while and people are now out. I think it's gonna be a while, but during the pandemic, I would say the most common problem became, have I wasted time? Uh, I was in a relationship on and off for six years. They would say it didn't work. N now, wasted time. This this idea that their relationship failures, my marriage failed, which is not a. It took me a, a number of years to realize it's like the wrong language because so many people they had a marriage that ended, but it certainly wasn't a failed marriage. The mm -hmm. marriage that ended, which is like a pretty big difference. Like it's like all these lessons were learned and all this love was had and maybe you are now moving on to something else, but I certainly wouldn't call it a fail, failed marriage. So getting people to understand that this is not, so many people think they really have to like die with a one partner, like in the, in the book and movie, The Notebook, where you like die at the exact same time, like curled up into a spoon. Like I don't, that's not how it, that's not how it works. So you don't believe necessarily in soulmates or I do you not. feel that maybe you know, less, um, do, you, do you feel like monogamous relationships are kind of antiquated? I, well, I definitely don't believe in soulmates. I mean, how terrible would it be if we only had like one? I mean, even if you believe that there are multiple the ones, that's still a lot of pressure on, the, I mean, I think there are, and I think some people who feel like soulmates aren't necessarily the people we should really be with. They're just like people who, who are make, make meaning in our lives at different times. But in terms of the monogamy question, which I think is different, I think that's, in the eye of the beholder, because um, I know of, of certainly of relationships where people are in polyamorous relationships, open relationships that work so well for them. And then I know other couples where that just wouldn't work. And I think that to me, if we get to a place where it's all accepted and believed and embraced that people have these different preferences, that's so much better um, because I, I would like that to feel a little more normal. And I say that by the way, as someone who like, like I, I have a relative who has had an open relationship for a long time. And, and I would always joke with her and say like, what, like you, how do you make space for more than one person? Like making space for one person seems like really hard romantically. Um, but she was like, you know, I, she would always say to me, like, I feel like if you watch less TV, like you could probably figure out where, so I think for me at this point in my life, I don't know that my brain could handle more than one partner. And I'm probably raised in a generation of monogamy being sort of the standard. However, I think it really works great for a lot of people. And I find it so interesting that straight people, I know this often like are like 15 to 20 years late with sort of mimicking a culture that works really well. 
And um, one of the things that I've always liked that Dan Savage has said as an advice columnist is that like at times in his marriage, there have certainly been other people, but he's still married happily. So, and there's so many people who believe only in monogamy who can't make a relationship last. So uh, we got a question here. Do advice columnists have happier or more adjusted lives than mere mortals? <laughs> no, no. And, and um, you know, Margot Howard, who is Ann Lander's daughter, used to live in town and she's, you know, we have a friendship and she once summoned me to her apartment, sort of like, who are you new on the scene? And I, she is an absolute delight to talk to but her so her mother was Ann Landers her aunt would have been Dear Abby in a conflicted way but um I said to her when I first met her she was like oh you know do you have a partner and I was like oh no no, no. I like never date I never date I'm like like I I'm just a voyeur and she said oh well I've been married four times and I was like well we're t we're two pretty common advice columnists right I mean I think that you know listen it's easier to tell people what I think from the outside and harder. To, I think I've become a better person in my romantic life because of learning from the people who write to me and learning from readers. Like that I feel really lucky about. All right, so uh, all right, I wanna remind you of something. Uh, we have a strange anniversary of nine, nine, was it nine years ago today? Let's see, tell me, tell me a little bit about this. I'm so ready for whatever this is. Do you know what this is? Oh, this is from my memory because I believe this would be the, um, oh my God, what is the event called? Story, is it, yeah. what is it called? It's, it's it, people read, three people read and then there are judges. Um, literary, it's literary death match. Literary death match, literary death match, which is like, almost like a competitive moth. Is that the best way you, oh my God, is that already nine years ago? Yeah, um, here we are. And it's nine years ago today. Nine years ago today. Look at all these maskless people in a comedy studio. That's like lovely to see. Um, oh my God, what a great, what a great literary memory moment. Um, I hope they're still doing literary deathmatch. It was a lot of they fun. Are. Um, I would like to go to one uh, again just this idea of like three people reading, three people reading and, and yes. being judged on no, like it, the subjectivity of it. No, it's just like, I like this, but, but it's more like, I, I found it so fun to just like hear people and, and I don't know, it's a, it's a, what a great, thank you for sharing that. What a great event. Um, yeah, so we, yeah, we lost to uh, Chip Creek and I yeah. think it's, and Chip's a great writer, but I had a re little resentment that his, uh, one of the characters in my last novel, I named Shades Creek, and I didn't realize that I was doing it because of Chip. <laughs> it's a, what a great, I mean, listen, if you're gonna have name jealousy, Chip Creek is a pretty good name. I don't know. I love that name. Oh, it's a great name. Totally a great name. So good, good for Chip. Um, yeah, like I loved um, pretending I was, you know, there's something about feeling like a beat poet up in a microphone where you're just like reading your words, even just now, like that's a, that's a nice thing in a comedy studio, so. Yeah, that was a lot of fun. Well, anyway, thank you so much for being our guest. And hold up your new book again, because it was a wonderful reading from it. There it is, Things That Grow. A great and cover. I, I I feel like I did not deserve that. Like this woman who did this, she also designed some like beer, really cool, like organic beer. And like, she's just a really beautiful illustrator. So when I first saw it, I was like, wow, I hope the words deserve, have earned this cover, so. Yeah, so uh, check it out. And I always, we always ask people what your favorite, there it is again, um, what your favorite, um, and we did talk about Can't Help Myself, the memoir, and there that is. And- um, yeah, Like nonfiction, that's the way to go. Chemistry Lessons is there. Yeah, and my it's first book, The Singles, which is now kind of hard to find, but that, I, I think that was what I was talking about at Literary Deathmatch, which is a book about a bunch of single people at a wedding. So check it out. So what is your favorite India bookstore, Mary? Oh my God, I might, that's like picking a favorite. Um, I will say that I launched my book, Things That Grow with Porter Square and that I will not play favorites, but I will say that I love their commitment to young adult, but I also love their growing commitment to romance and any bookstore that would have been too snobby to sell romance novels that has now gone all in the other way. I am proud of them. 
a lot of bookstores are now embracing romance and that's when I know they're good. And I, I drive up to the Silver Unicorn a lot also because I like to. So awesome. So everyone should go to the Porter Square Books website and order online and they'll send you a copy or your other favorite indie bookstores. I'm sure we're glad to as well. So uh, people that are watching live on Facebook, we're going to stop your stream right now. Uh, if you want to read at the open mic, quickly jump on the Zoom because you still can. If you want to be involved in the Q&A in the future, uh, use the link instead. So thank you for tuning in and uh, we'll see you. Uh, a few Facebook people later.